So I'm going to start sharing my screen and we will get going. So you all should have, and we just checked. So I think you all got your uh, midterm up and loaded. So we should be good to go there. Um, <clears throat> so, um, but, uh, if you got any questions, we'll be grading the midterm over the next, uh, next uh, while. So we'll be getting results back to you here soon. Um, just by the way, you should you hopefully you did both of them. Uh, the the compass campus comp, compass mid um, multiple choice, and then the open ended question. Those will be combined to get our get our get our total example or total midterm grade done. So um, we will be doing that. This week, I'm going to go over our lecture notes. So the lecture notes here are week six. Here's the material that we're going to use in class. I've already downloaded lecture notes for week six, and they're here. A uh, couple of announcements, October 1, which was today at noon. So we're past it. You had till midterm to, to complete that. We will have modules this week on the basics of bonds. They are not up there yet. I'm working feverishly at getting those up there and they will be up there by the end of the day. So look for those. And there will be a homework and asset tracking due at noon on April 6th. We, uh, I think you'll find that this uh, just, we're gonna, we're gonna be easy on you. The, the homework isn't that difficult. So, um, but, uh, and the modules will, relate to it. So, and we're beginning our bond financing part of the class. So look forward to that. We're moving from equities to bond financing. So there's where we're going. So let's talk about uh, um, um, what our outline is for today is we're going to do three things. I'm going to do another exercise with our mute with a mutual fund. And you'll see that that will build into our second topic, our value investing. And uh, Enrique put together an example of value investing. And, and just to separate these two out here, there's sort of the portfolio approach where you believe everything is market is efficient or you act as if it's market efficient. And um, then you make your decision based on risk and returns. Value investing specifically evaluates the uh, stocks or the, the companies that are going to go into your stocks and picks those stocks. And then finally, we're gonna go over a bond exercise example, and this is gonna be pretty close to what you're doing for the midterm, or excuse me, not the midterm, you're done with the midterm, um, but your homework for, for next week. So that's our outline, and I am going to begin here again with our exercise with a, another mutual fund. I have, we're going to look, and I'm, we're going to complete together, or I'm going to work through the Fidelity Blue Chip Growth Fund. So I'm going to go through this B Fidelity Blue Chip Growth Fund. We're going to complete this exercise here, and we're going to complete it. And this is essentially the, the fund comparison sheet that we've done before. I've added a little couple lines here at the end where we, we've more broken out more alpha, beta, and our trend ratio. But we'll talk about that when we get there. Let me first go to our um, Compass website. And now I have put the prospectus here for Fidelity Blue Chip Growth. I'm going to open that. You can open that too, but I, one of the reasons why, there's a couple of reasons why I picked this fund to go over. First off, all right, think about this. And if you want to, so blue chip growth, where do you think this blue chip growth relates to the re risk and return from Vanguard 500? All right, think about that for a minute. Do you think this fund has higher risk, higher return, or lower risk and lower return than our 
Vanguard 500 fund. And remember our Vanguard 500 fund is stocks in the S&P 500 blend large cap, okay? And it's an index fund. So it just, this, this fund seeks to mimic the Vanguard, the S&P 500. All right, so think about that. We'll come back to that question, but I wanna go down a bit in our summary prospectus and I'll give you the same advice that everybody will do and you, no, nobody does, myself included. You should read the prospectus before you invest in a mutual fund. It's, it's a good thing. But if you look at the mutual fund, they're all basically structured the same way. And I'm just going to go through a couple lines here. First off, they'll, we, they'll give you the objective. And this fund seeks growth and capital over the long term. Already, you know something about this fund. It seeks growth. So it's most likely an actively managed fund. So it's going to seek growth. And it's looking at that over the long run. It's all, all these prospectuses are going to tell you the annual operating expenses and they can't, they cannot exceed these. And this one has a 0.79%. Again, 0.79%. So if you had $1,000 invested, it would, the fees from this would be 0.79, less than 1%, 0.79%. So each year um, that would work out to be, I believe, $7.90. So they can't exceed that. Those are the fees that this fund uses to cover all their cost and also provide themselves a profit for running the fund. So those things are always stated in the prospectus. Fees can't, ex annual operating expenses can't change it. They'll also give you the portfolio turnover, 49% in this case. But here's where I want to come to. All right, principal investment strategies. And again, everybody will say that, but we'll have to put their investment strategies in here. But one thing to note here, they're changing their investment strategies. So effective December 1, 2020, note, effective December 1, 2020, they will normally invest primarily in common stocks. All right, so effective that date, they will invest primarily in common stocks. Prior to December 2020, they would invest primarily stocks in well-known and established companies. So they're taking out the requirement here of well-known and established companies. All right, so that's a change. And again, you can look at this as their contract with their investors. Um, they're saying how they're going to invest in this fund, they're the, the, the the amount that you that an individual investor puts into the fund. They're telling you how they're going to make those investments. The next thing they tell us is they will normally invest at least, effective December 1, normally invest at least 80% of assets in blue chip stocks or blue chip companies. And then they say that that, what's a blue chip will be developed, will be determined by Fidelity Management Research Company's view. And they're looking for well-known, well-established, and well-capitalized, all right? So they're saying we're gonna put well-established, well-known, well-capitalized. And prior to that, they invested in blue chip companies. So they're changing their definition of what their blue chip stocks are. All right, and they're, and um, so you can you can see what they're they they're changing. They're telling you they're going to change the way they're investing. How that will play out, I'm not sure. But uh, you you could probably go back and read some of their PR statements about when they made that change or public relations statements and see what they're trying to do with that. 
And they, again, are investing in companies that FMR believes have above average potential. So, and they're going to use fundamental analysis. We're going to talk about fundamental analysis, or Enrique is going to give you an example of fundamental analysis here shortly. All right. So that's some background. Now, now you can use the prospectus, or I'm going to just, I got the prospectus right here, or I got our fund comparison sheet right here. And I am going to go to Yahoo Finance. And we're just going to do this quickly. I am going to Yahoo Finance. Come on, maybe not quickly. Today. And this is Fidelity, Fidelity Blue Chip Stock. All right, so there we go. And we already know some things, but if you look look at their profile here, you're going to see most of the things that we talked about. They're going to give you their fund, their summary, seeks capital growth over the long run. So we can put, put that, that's their objective here, seeks capital growth. Oops. Okay, okay, okay. All right. I'm going to wrap that text. And let and we already and it said here it will invest in common stock with 80% in blue chip. And then if we come over here and look at our Morningstar box, we will see that this is a large cap. It's a growth and it is active management. And we know that this is 49% because it said so in the prospectus and we could find that here as well. All right, now I wanted you to compare this to Vanguard 500. Let me just hide this column for a minute because I'm not going to talk about this for a little bit. So we're looking at the Vanguard 500 and the Fidelity Blue Chip Growth. This one's blend, this one's growth. So growth, all right, when you think about income blend growth, you think about growth as having higher returns higher risk than blend or income. So that would suggest that this one's going to have higher returns, higher expected risk, or higher returns and higher risk than our Vanguard 500. Large, you can't say anything, but if this was small, as you're moving down from large to small, you expect higher returns and higher, higher risk. So overall, we would expect Fidelity blue chip growth to have higher returns, higher risks than Vanguard 500 just by that style analysis. So you can often say something about the fund without, without, um, <coughs> without looking at its previous returns. All right, and then we'll just, we'll just pull this from here. Um, and here's our strategy right there. And we'll put their investment strategy right there. Wrap the text again. So there it is. All right. We saw, and you can get also the fees. Summary sheet. Actually, it was right there too. Expense ratio 0 0.80. It has, it has, um, 
0.80, 0 percent. And then if we go to performance, we go to performance here, we see its performance in the last year, 61 percent and did rather well. And five year, 22 point seven nine and this one twenty two point seven nine oops I'm getting and this one is twenty point nine so if we're looking at and let me and let me just get the rest of these alpha we can pull those from here as well those will be in our risk profile Again, we have three year, five years. So this will be using three years of data, alpha, five years and 10 years. So three years, we're looking at alpha of 10 point, oops, what happened there? Oh, I got a totally different thing. There we go, there's the risk. Alpha is 10.58, 6.1, 3.74. 1.12, 1.11, 1.12. And the trend ratio is 23.82, 19.5. Eighteen point two six. All right, as we're looking at this, alpha, it has, let's interpret this, alpha, it's alpha over the last three years, five years, and 10 years have exceeded the market controlling for risk. So this firm has a 1.12 to 1.11 beta. Given that point on the curve, it still has excess returns of 10.58%. That is good. And, and, and you would sort of expect that given, given these very high past performance returns. So those, those tend to be correlated. This one has beta 1.12, 1.11. So it's from that perspective, more risky than the market. And finally, the trend error ratio is higher. So for a given level of risk, the blue chip, Fidelity blue chip stock has performed better or provided more return than Vanguard 500. Let's unhide this so we can see all three. And from this perspective, from all these, so from this measure, trend ratio, it's better than these two measures, at least historically. And it's had higher alpha, bit higher risk. So that gives you a feel. Now again, the issue here is that we're looking in the past, so you don't know how, how this will do in the future. One final thing, you can quickly find out. So this is Fidelity Blue Chip Growth Fund. If you go to the holdings here, it's going to list the top 10 holdings of the fund, which will account for 46.88% of its total assets. So if you want to know what's held in the fund, you can see quickly, and here's what you're going to see with this fund. Amazon, Apple, Microsoft, Alpha, Alphabet, which is Google, Facebook, NVDI, I don't know what that is, Tesla. So of its... 10 major holdings, um, it's primary, it's weighted heavily toward growth funds. So this, this, this fund, if you wanna follow growth funds, this fund's gonna follow growth funds, at least as it is currently, um, currently put together. It will follow what growth funds do, so if growth stocks will do, so if you believe growth, Growth is going, growth or those tech stocks are going to do well in the future. This is your fund. Given that, you'll probably expect, let me, let's just see what this has done in the last month. 
Remember, you're following the tech stocks or you're following the S&P 500 and the tech stocks. Oops, I can, let me, it's not giving me my, I want it a little bit longer than the year. Let me do year to date. Yeah, you can see here, breached its high on September 2nd and it's been falling a bit. This is following the tech stocks and what's that been happening to the tech stocks here recently. I haven't followed it today, but you can, oops. But you can see what it what 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 it's been up to. All right. <clears throat> Again, we're going to come back to that fun comparison sheet. You're going to use this later on. You're going to complete. You're going to pick probably an equity fund to put your money in, and we're going to see. Uh, and one of the things you're going to do is complete that fund. All right. Questions or comments at this point in time? So, if not, I am going to stop sharing my screen. And Enrique, take her away. Yeah, let me share my screen. Uh... I'm going to mute myself just so we keep our bandwidth down. There you go. Can you can you guys confirm if you can see my screen? I can see your screen. <laughs> okay. Okay. So I think they should be able to see that. Okay. Hey, somebody type "Hey" in the screen <laughs> so we know somebody's out there. We can't see you sitting in a. Hey, thank you, Brian. <laughs> okay. Sometimes uh, we wonder. <laughs> <laughs> Are you uh, there? So uh, we've been talking a lot uh, about portfolio theory, right? Uh, so if you believe the market markets are efficient, uh, it's pretty much a mathematical problem to allocate your assets in a portfolio, right? Uh, to get the, the greater uh, risk efficiency, uh, risk reward uh, rate, right? We saw that correlation matters. Uh, but uh, we talked briefly in the module, but we would like to show you guys a little bit what uh, would uh, value or think that uh, as an an uh, active fundamentalist uh, manager or uh, value, not value, but active and fundamentalist approach to investments. Uh, and we're gonna go over an example. So uh, I think if you have it here with you, uh, valuation example, I'm gonna go over you guys and uh, we're gonna do a valuation here of a uh, company that you guys might, uh, I have heard, which is Apple. Uh, and we're going to discuss a little bit how would uh, the approach be if you want to do that kind of investing. Okay, so uh, I'm not going to go super into details, but the idea is for you guys to get uh, the idea of how it would, uh, how you could be doing that. Okay, and just to start, I want to uh, quickly remember you guys. Uh, let me just take this loading meeting controls out. And let me put that uh, Apple here on Yahoo Finance. Apple is trading right now at uh, 116, right? What does that mean? Like, wh why is in that 140 or 100 or 90 or 200? I don't know. What, what is that 116 that we are seeing here? Can someone uh, type it on the chat or what? what is the price of the stock that we are seeing. Now, if you guys are going to remember that, pro probably I think from the first module, I, yeah, I have the the slides here pulled. Uh, but this 116, if you remember, what is the stock price? This is uh, the value of uh, future cash flows discounted uh, for present value, right? So uh, how how is that made in practice? How how someone uh, got close to 116 and uh, other a little bit different, but then the price converges to 116. So what we are going to be doing here, it's a valuation example. Uh, it's what uh, essentially fundamentalist, uh, fundamental analysis does. Uh, you're basically looking at uh, the fundamentals, like the economic fundamentals behind the company to uh, you can module or you can guess, I don't know, like 
future cash flows for that firm. And then you're gonna discount it to present value to see what would be, according to your model, uh, what you believe in that fundamentals, uh, what would be the price of that stock or the, let's say the value of that stock should be. It doesn't necessarily mean that it is what you predicted, but this is kind of how they make their decisions. So if in my model, I think that Apple should be trading at 200 and I look at uh, stock market and it's trading at 116, what I would do, I would buy and wait because I think that at some point in the future, uh, this price will converge to what is worth it, what I believe it's worth it, okay? Uh, so we have here, I don't wanna like, make it too detailed, but feel free if you wanna ask me questions on, on the, the, the modeling part of that, okay? But what I have here, and uh, I wanna quickly go here to Yahoo Finance. Uh, so we have some data here on Apple. And if you go to financials over here, I'm gonna open it on another tab. Uh, because they are public companies, they're, they are required to uh, publish their uh, earnings releases or balance sheets income statements and cash flows. And Yahoo Finance has a, is a it's one of the places that you can uh, have access to that. Uh, so here I have the income statement, balance sheet and cash flow, and I'm open those three here. Uh, and we can see here how the company did historically. Maybe those raw numbers doesn't tell us much, but we can do some calculations. We can get uh, what, what are their, uh, let's say here their, it's probably somewhere here, total expenses, net income. What is their net income compared to their assets to get their uh, return on assets, for instance? And there are other websites as well. Let me open one here. Uh, this is Seeking Alpha. It's just another one like Yahoo Finance. Uh, let me just type up over here. So that they also have in here, if you wanna look, or financial or clicking in earnings. So uh, they also post, or they also have data here on Apple. So I'm looking here at, let's zoom in a little bit. So revenues, this is up to 2015. If you pay here, you see that it's locked. You can get access to older data. But if you go to Apple, uh, if you look Apple uh, IR, which is investor relations, you're gonna be finding, so every public, public company has this investor relations page somewhere and they publish their results. So for instance, this is uh, third quarter results. We can view the press release over here, for instance. You probably can find here uh, 2009, let's say here quarter one day annual. Uh, this is from 10K, so this is pretty much accounting, but they, they also publish like an explanation behind it, which doesn't necessarily mean uh, pure accounting. So this is just numbers, but they, they, they talk about it. So they're gonna say, okay, our revenue was X uh, and it was greater than expected because of that, because of that, uh, our industry is consolidating. Uh, we see that demand for that product is it's increasing. So they publish those things uh, for you investors or uh, any investors to uh, read and make their decisions, okay? And our module here, we're gonna be, be using Yahoo Finance numbers, but we could have get, get those numbers from anywhere, okay? So what I have here uh, on this highlighted uh, interval our revenues, EBITDA. I hope you guys are familiar with that. Okay, if not, please interrupt me if you wanna know, but uh, I'm gonna be talking some uh, kind of accounting terms. Uh, so feel free to interrupt me if you don't uh, know what that means, okay? But revenues, EBITDA, depreciation, EBIT, taxes. And I am getting, uh, I'm using here an approach to uh, derive a cash flow here. Uh, there are others as well that you can use. And I'm using this, uh, it's called leverage cash flow. And basically from revenues, I'm getting uh, the net operating profit, profit after taxes. So I'm assuming there is no tax shield from interest. I'm adding back uh, capture expenditures or subtracting actually and variation in working capital. 
because they demand cash from the company. And what is left is I have here a free cash flow. So uh, on that year, this is what Apple generated, uh, generated uh, as far as cash flow, free cash flow, okay? And this cash flow here that I'm projecting is the cash flow available to all creditors, which includes so debt and also equity, which is what an investor will be uh, caring about, right? And over here, I have some drivers that I am making this, I made this a quite simple module. Uh, and I am uh, using some drivers to forecast uh, its revenues, EBITDA margins and cash flows ultimately, okay? So I'm saying here, uh, this is I just got from the last five years. So uh, I think, for instance, here on uh, speaking alpha, if I go to uh, growth, again, I could have calculated that. I Maybe you can use a crystal ball to do that. I mean, doesn't matter, okay? But I use here, so this is the, the average revenue growth year to year for the last, uh, I believe, five years here. I don't know, 5.72. So I assume here, from Yahoo, it was a little bit higher, uh, 6.10. So it means that this revenue over here is growing 6% a year, okay? And we, you guys have the spreadsheet. There's probably different numbers over here, so you can update with whatever company you want, but I can do whatever I want here. So I want I want the, the revenue to grow 6.5% a year, it's growing, okay? Uh, now I do the same thing for the EBITDA margin. So I'm kind of locking it uh, on 30.88%, but I can also look at growth. So the EBITDA margin historically has been growing at 2% a year and I can just, uh, so do the last one times 1 1.2 and kind of drag it. So the EBITDA margin is increasing over time and I can module that however I want, okay? So this is what fundamental analysis will do. So it will look at the industry, uh, economic, if, uh, or economy, if like that would be demand because of COVID, if people will still buying uh, products from Apple, maybe Apple it has demonstrated an interest in another company or buying another company. Uh, company and I believe that uh, that would lead to increases in margins, okay? So ultimately here, I am then projecting here, forecasting, free cash flows for Apple, okay, for the, uh, for the next five years. Why I don't move more? Uh, I actually, I do. And I usually, when you do the kind of evaluation, you don't think that the company will, uh, let's say, go bankrupt or, it will exist forever by its operation. So that's why I have here uh, something called Ever, <laughs> which uh, I will use to project that cash flow to the perpetuity. So after year six, Apple will generate that cash flow and I will apply just a growth rate on that, okay? So I have here, uh, this is all in thousands. So I can say here on, I think that on 2025, Apple will generate $93 billion, if I'm not mistaken here. One, two, yeah, in cash flow, okay? This is for all equity and creditors as well, okay? So this is the leverage cash flow approach. Uh, by doing that, uh, what I need to do, if you remember what is the, the, the stock price, meaning of the stock price, is the, the value of the future cash flows discounted to today's value, okay? Uh, and I don't know if you guys are familiar with that terminology, WAC. Okay, this is uh, it's called, uh, WAC is weighted average cost of capital. So because this is the cash flow available to all debt that uh, Apple has, so banks, let's say, and also equity, which are we, let's say if, as we investors, uh, I, I can find the cost of the debt. And also I can uh, use here, for instance, the cap and module that we were, we were uh, talking about to estimate what would be the cost of equity or my required rate of return to invest in that company, okay? I did it, okay? I just put here the, the cost of debt. I left that open if you would do that uh, like for a company or something, you're probably gonna module that and, or dig through Apple's uh, investor uh, relations uh, releases and we'll find it somewhere. But I put here that on average, the cost of that, so uh, Apple has a 4.5% cost of that. Uh, I will take the, the tax rate out of that because 
uh, when you pay taxes, you don't pay, or actually, let me rephrase that. There is a tax shield. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that. In uh, having debt, if you have more debt, your, your uh, pre-tax income, it's lower. So you pay less taxes. And that's why we do that adjustment here. And I did here using beta, market returns and risk free asset calculated 14.2, which will be the CAPM uh, pricing model returns for uh, Apple, okay? This is what I, I am expecting uh, if I invest uh, in Apple to get as a return, considering its beta or its volatility uh, against the market. Does that make sense? I hope it does. So uh, I can see you guys. So I don't know if you guys are completely lost or following me. Uh, so I just use the deck, the capital structure of Apple here. I'm just assuming here because I didn't uh, dig through. I think it is something like that. So it has 70% of its asset financed with debt and 31% does financed with equity. Okay. So this is uh, like accounting. Okay. I hope you guys have some, uh, some knowledge of that because otherwise you might be completely lost and that's fine. But it's just a demonstration here. So I got the weighted average cost of capital. And this is uh, what I will use as a discount rate to bring those future cash flows to present value, okay? So I already said here that Apple is gonna generate this much of cash flows going forward, according to what I believe that the company would do. And I will discount now the cash flows using a 7.1 discount rate. When I do that, so for instance, on year five, I said here that company or Apple would generate $93 billion of cash. Now in present value, that represents $66 billion of cash, okay? So I'm bringing everything to present value, right? And I have here the sum of the five first years that I forecasted. And the sixth year that I said here that I'm gonna project it forever, I am just applying here, so this is the cash flow in year six. I'm saying that forever, going from year six to forever, uh, the cash flow will grow 3% a year, okay? If that's much or not, that's a, a very uh, important discussion, right? Because over here, we are basically saying that Apple grow its cash flows at 3% a year. I think if you think, uh, I think last time I saw like the, the projections for the US entire economy for long-term growth was 2.5, I think. So we are assuming that Apple is gonna grow forever more than the US economy, for instance. If that's realistic or not, I don't know, we can change it, okay? Uh, that's why we are doing that, that model, okay? Now I have here the terminal value or the sum of all cash flows going from year six forever. And again, I, I am bringing it back to present value, okay? So I have here its uh, value here uh, of all cash flows. Now, what it's worth in present value, okay, according to my discount rate. Uh, we add also the non-operating assets here because that approach, I'm, I'm just caring about its operations. So if there's assets, uh, marketable securities that are not part of the operation, I can value them as well. And this is kind of the, the formula to get um, the sum uh, the value firm, uh, the value of the firm, which is the sum of all cash flows, the present value of future cash flows forever, plus the, the non-operating assets. Okay. Uh, with that, I can I am estimating here just by summing it now because it's everything in present value that Apple has uh, here a value of two trillion dollars. Okay, this is remember this is thousands, so if you do this times. This is what I believe that Apple should be worth in, uh, should be worth it, uh, two trillion dollars. But now remember that I said that the cash flows I was projecting, I took interest out because uh, there was the cash flow for all creditors, both debt or ec and equity. Uh, so I'm just gonna take the net debt out and this is what uh, it's left uh, for equity, okay? So let's say here, so, what I am projecting is that a Apple, according to my key drivers here, should be worth it uh, $2 trillion and $32 billion, okay? 
I don't know if you guys believe it or not, right? Uh, and uh, this is a module, uh, so just like some modeling. Uh, again, the module is just as good as our assumptions are, okay? Um, and finally, I get this value of that a company and divide by what it, this is already the value that it's after that. So it's just for investors or for equity. And I divide that by the number of outstanding uh, shares which again, I can get all of that uh, on Yahoo or the other one. I think the, the outstanding shares will be found here on the balance sheet. Yeah. Uh, and I get what should be the value per share. Okay, so I got here, I kind of uh, played with that a little bit before to get a close number. Uh, so I think that Apple should be worth in 115 according to that prediction. Now, you guys think that Apple will grow 5.6.5% uh, a year, and after year six, 3%, which is more than the, the US economy. So let's say, you no, know, let's stress a little bit that and say it is 2% after that. I think EBITDA is gonna be flat uh, on 30, okay? So I'm just playing with that and look at, what was the result? So if I think that Apple will not grow more uh, three years after the year six and EBITDA margin will not grow anymore, it was still like 30, then Apple should be value, uh, Apple, Apple's value for the equity or for investors should be just 1.4, 1.5 here, $3 trillion. Therefore, its share should be worth at 84. So you see like the, the broad range of here. And uh, that's why there is a uh, quote that says like, it's better for you to be while, while you're modeling those kind of things, approximately right than precisely wrong. Because it doesn't matter if I did a calculation with super sophisticated model, if my assumptions are wrong, the whole model is, is like useless kind of, okay? And it's very difficult to predict actually the future. So. Fundamental analysis, what they would do, so I have here, okay, 105. And I have here just a sensibility here. Uh, if you wanna take the company, will we stick with 35% uh, and growing 7% in its revenue, it should be worth in 124. If on the other hand, 4% on revenue growth and 20% should be worth in 55%. So what fundamental analysis they are essentially doing it's this, okay, so they're using some uh, drivers or factors and analysis to uh, forecast what would be the future cash flows of the company, okay? They project that, uh, they bring it back to present value, take all the, the debt part out, and what is left, it's what is left as a uh, firm value for investors. Just divide that by the outstanding numbers uh, or outstanding shares and you find what should be the value that you believe per share. Now, if I think that Apple, let's say here, I'm gonna put 3% over here and let's put 7% and just making it, it's gonna be worth it. Uh, let me do a little bit more over here. So let me put EBITDA is gonna be uh, growing 3% a year. I think that it should be worth in, uh, 126. When I look here at the price, 116. So I believe because of some imperfection in the market, remember I, I'm not that uh, market efficient guy. So uh, I believe that the market has an imperfection here and the true value of Apple should be 126. So I will buy Apple and wait eventually for the price to converge to what it's worth it, okay? So this is what they are doing, I think, on a monthly basis. I don't know. Uh, so this is one approach. And by the way, when you look here, a lot of websites also, they kind of have their mechanical, what, which is what I'm gonna be showing you guys on Python. But they have their valuation as well, right? So the market is kind of averaging all those valuations, right? Because if you evaluated Apple uh, as I did, uh, which was worth in more than the market is prediction, I'm willing to buy. 
But on the other hand, if you valuated Apple at 90, you don't want to buy. And if you have it, you might be willing to sell and make your profit right away. So this is what this price means. Okay. Uh, so questions here on that um, for just like quickly show you guys uh, what would that be on Python? So it's essentially the same thing. I hope that, that, that you guys followed part of that because uh, I can't see you guys again, but uh, go over that spreadsheet if you want, play with the numbers, try to plug uh, numbers from a different company over here. You see what is, what's the value of the company. And uh, just for you to get a sense. Uh, you can also, instead of saying that Apple, Apple's value will be like 2 trillion, 0.2 billion, from uh, 200 billion, I can, I can, and that's what usually they do. It's uh, present that number in form of a multiple, right? So when they are using multiples, uh, they are doing the same kind of fundamental thing here, fundamental analysis here, to get to a number, but they are just presenting that uh, in a different form that might be uh, easier for investors to follow, let's say, okay? So I'm just dividing its value here to its EBIT and it's 30. My, project, my projection for future EBIT is 28. Okay, if I go here on, I think that it's statistics maybe here in Apple. Yeah, so enterprise value to EBITDA. So they think that it's 23. So my model over here, my prediction, 24. Okay, so I can use that as well, but it's essentially the same thing that is just presented differently, okay? And as you guys remember, so the two things that essentially, if you believe in fundamental analysis that can change the stock price, is either the company performance, like you generate more cash flows, and it can come from uh, growth or uh, efficiency, let's say increased returns on assets, okay? Or uh, something that it, you can debate as well is, okay, what's this discount rate that I should use? Okay, what if the risk-free rate now it's five in the market, it's just returning 7%. So the cost of equity now it's way different, right? And does the discount rate in my module because of interest rates and such. And look how did it change like completely my evaluation over here. So it's very sensitive because you're doing something for forever. <laughs> so if it's slightly wrong over here, it's gonna be compounding that forever. So, uh, but that's essentially the only thing that could uh, change the firm value, okay? You're either increasing or decreasing cash flows or you are changing the discount rate, okay? So stock splits, uh, I don't know, what else? Mergings, acquisitions, essentially they don't change the value, uh, but maybe they are sign signalizing that in the future, they're gonna achieve higher uh, margins or they're gonna grow. Uh, and that's what is behind this uh, increasing value that you see sometimes uh, the reaction to the news, okay? So finally over here, I'm just gonna quickly let that for you guys, if you guys wanna play as well. Uh, it's essentially the same thing that we did, but that's on Python here, I'm using Apple as well. Just have to change that ticker. And I am assuming that Apple will stay like it is forever. So let me just, do Tesla here, for instance, because it's uh, be, been doing good, it's probably gonna be a higher valuation, but let's see. And what I can do here on Python, which I think is good, instead of having just one, or you can do a lot of data tables and get this uh, sensibility, you can plug in instead of, uh, oops, instead of, just like three values or four or five, you can say, okay, now maybe I want my revenue growth here, my sales growth to have this distribution. And I wanna see how it would play a role like if it's all of the numbers. And for instance, when I got this for Tesla, it became negative. So because of the, 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 the inputs I used, I wouldn't buy for instance, okay? Uh, so this is pretty much what they do. 
uh, again, feel free to go over the spreadsheet. If you have further questions on how it's done, there's several ways to do it, but it, we thought that it would be good for you guys to understand this other approach, not, maybe not in depth, but it's not, if you don't believe that markets are efficient, that's a way for you to go if you wanna uh, be a well investor or fundamental analysis, analyst. Questions or comments or uh, before I pass it back to Gary? Nope. Okay. I'll stop sharing here. And you can have it back, Gary. All right. All right. I should be back unmuted and I'm going to start sharing my screen now. Sure. All right. Oops. All right. So where we're going next, oops, is I am going to do this bond exercise. If we go to our website, I'm going to use this bond in class example XLSX here. To, uh, to do that, I have downloaded the spreadsheet and I've got it right here. So let me put this up here and there it is. Let me zoom it up a little bit and I'm gonna go a little bit higher here. Let's see, all right, there we go. <clears throat> we are moving now into bond, fixed incomes, and that will be our second module of the course. Our first module deal primarily with equities. So we were looking at equity investments and equities tend to be or are stocks of firms. And remember that stocks of firms are the residual claimants. You have all the upside. Most firms also have, besides equity, they have debt as well that's publicly traded. Their debt also comes from treasuries and corporate, uh, corporate entities as well, or that's where we can get bonds. I'm now gonna work through an example of a bond case. The part, in, in the modules this week, we'll look at this as well. And our homework will be very similar to this. So what we're gonna do is get you familiar with uh, some of the terms associated with treasury bonds in particular. Treasuries are uh, debt of the US federal government. It has a couple of characteristics. You believe it has no default risk, all right? And this is important from a bond standpoint. All right, for a bond, there generally is no upside and the risk come from not getting the bond paid in a timely fashion. So, and that's called default. And, and so if, if, a, if a company, corporation, municipality, um, any entity that issues debt does not make a scheduled payment, that's a default. So for example, if you have a car loan and you miss the payment by one day, you are technically in default. You have defaulted on your loan and there, that's a default risk. Treasuries, you believe, or act like they have no default risk. And the reason why is US can print money. <laughs> If, it, if it, it, it should have no issue making the payments on its debt because it can make money. It's, and sovereign governments are the only ones that have that tendency. So they would have no default risk. Where you see individuals or a sovereign government, if, they're, if, if they have difficulty making their payments, what they do is inflate their economy, or inflate their currency and have high inflation rates. That's, that's how in practice a, a federal, a, a sovereign government goes into, goes into a, 
uh, into default or can't make its payments, it inflates its economy. We're going to act as if this federal government or this, this treasury has no default risk, so we're not concerned about that. So we have a safe investment and we believe we're going to get every payment on there. The way we're going to do treasuries is we're going to, I'm going to give an example. And again, this is also covered in the modules. We're going to do a T note and it's going to be due year in four years from now. We're going to have a coupon rate of 2%. The coupon rate is what the, uh, the, the treasury bill will pay on. So it will make two, a payment of its par at 2% semi-annually and we're going to assume that its yield is 1.5 percent and the yield to maturity is the discount factor that causes let me write this down here that causes the, the cash flows to equal the bond price the discount of cash flows to equal the bond price Okay. So I'm telling you that with this 1.5%, I am telling you that this bond has, if we look at its bond price and discount its cash flows, the bond price equals 1.5%. And I'm going to show you something now. I'm going to go to my Wall Street Journal site. Just a minute here, and I'm going to go to market data. If we get there quickly, market. Come on. Market data. Oh, come on. Oh, why is it being snickety today? It's maybe I'm not going here. There we go. Market data home. And I'm going to bonds. All right. Here, if we're looking at bond price, we have a 30 year bond, 10 year note, seven year note, five year note, three year note, all the way down to one month bill. So right here, these are all treasuries. Okay. And if I'm looking at that, currently the 30 year bond has a 1.45% uh, yield. So that's what over the 30 years, if we look, take this 30 year bond, lay out its cash flows, bring it, discount them back to the present, its bond price will equal the discounted for cash flows of 1.455%. All right, as you go down here, 10 year note 0.676, and that's by the way, 0.676%. Go down here, 0.274%. So you can see here, these yields are very low right now. And, and, and again, the way this market works is there's a price change and as the price goes up, yield goes down. Price goes down on a bond, yield goes up. You're paying less and getting the same payments, so therefore your yield is, is, is going up. All right, so the, the, there's an inverse relationship there. All right, the market, when, when we're looking at the market, they're bidding these prices, and then you can calculate the yields. So today the yield went down on the 30-year bond very small amount, but the, what that implies is the prices on bonds went up. Okay. All right. And again, we're very low yields at this point in time. All right. If I tell you this, you can tell me what the bond cash flows look like. And you're always going to assume that they're semi-annual payments. If, if it's a treasury note and it's over a year, until its maturity, you do know 
that its payments are semi-annual. Um, we are going to follow the convention of dividing yields and rates by two to come up with our semi-annual rates. All right. And that's the way bond pricing works. It just is. And we're going to use a par of $1,000. And this par here, again, is what will be returned at the end of the period. And it is also, so that's what the par is. It's what you get back at the end of the year period. It's the principal and what payments are based on. All right, or your coupon payments are based on. All right, so here I have a treasury note. It's due in four years, 2% coupon rate, 1.5% yield to maturity. All right, if it's four years in length, I have eight periods, okay? Eight semi-annual periods. There's two semi-annual periods per year. So we came up with eight. All right, now my cash flow, I'm gonna have the same coupon payment in years one, or semi-annual period one through eight, okay? And that payment is going to equal a thousand, the par times my coupon rate. My coupon rate is what I get paid. 2% and I'm gonna divide that by two. So it's 1% per, per semi-annual period, that's $10. I'm going to get that same payment for each one of the periods for the next eight periods. So $10 for each period, plus the one in 10 years from now, or the eighth period now, I'm on gonna get my $1,000 back. So here are the payments from that four-year semi-annual payment bond. Six months from now, I get $10. Year from now, I get $10. Two years for a semi-annual periods in the future, I get $10. Four years in the future, eight year, eight semi-annual periods, I get 10,000, or excuse me, 1,000, the payment on the bond, plus the coupon payment. All right, now, yield to maturity, I said it was 1.5%. If we state that in semi-annual periods, I'm gonna divide by two. That's uh, three quarters of a percent. All right, I am going to calculate my discount factor just like I always do. So it's going to be 7.075% raise that to the number of periods in the future. And I'm gonna drop that down. Oops, forgot to make that stable. So this is my discount factor moving into the future. Those discount factors are going down over time. Then I'm gonna discount each of my cash flows. And there we have it. There's my $1,010 in four years or eight semi in your periods is currently worth $951.40. And if I sum those up, I get my bond is worth 10,000, or excuse me, $1,019.34. So if we, if we change the coupon payment, we rate, we could get, we would get a different cash flows, different bond price, but it's all driven off this yield to maturity of 1.5% per annum, which works out to be three quarters of a percent per semi-annual period. All right. That is how bonds are priced. And, and, and it's, if I would increase the, let me just do something here. So I got the bond price with 1.5%. Copy this down here. All right, so my bond at 1.5% is 10, 1,19.34. If I make this two and a half percent, Oops. 
my bond price is going down. All right. So it went down to 981. I, I had a, it has to go down to get a two and a half percent. And this, let me do 0 0.035. So there you go. That's the inverse relationship. All right. The other thing about bonds is that if I know the bond price, I can tell you the yield. Okay. And let and and the what and let me just lay out the yield to maturity formula. All right. The formula for the discount each of the discount factors is. It's one over, all right, so let me try and write this. I'm gonna try and write this as an equation so that you can say insert an equation, yeah. All right, so the, the, disc, the, the discount factor is for any period is, let me put this this way. It is one, one, and let me just write this all. All right, so U divided by two raised to the N. So this will be to the N. Oops. All right, and I'll, I'll do the I'll do the formula again. All right, so that is the discount factor for any period. Uh, just screwed it up. All right, this is the formula. Let me show it to you over here. So this, so, So there, there it is. So we are taking one divided by one plus E13 raised to the eighth period. Ben, we will have that video up there later today. All right, so I, hopefully that helps. And we will put this video up here showing this formula later today. Hopefully that helps. But this is the formula. And you're going to see, so what this does is take one divided by one plus semi-annual rate raised to the eighth. And you're gonna see that this next one is raised to the seventh. Next one is raised to the sixth and so on and so forth. All right, and I'll, we'll make sure that there's a video with that up there. This is the formula for the yield to maturity. All right, so if you look at what we did, we took this yield to maturity and discounted each cash flow to come up with the bond price. This is the formula. And if you look at this, this Y here, is actually the internal rate of return. It is the internal rate of return. It is the ca what causes the, the cash flows to equal zero. Here's our cash flows from this bond. If we paid 1,000, 1934 for it, we pay for that now, we get $10, it's negative because we're paying for it. Then we get $10 cash flow, $10 cash flow, up to 
eight, and then we can use the internal rate of return to come up with this. If we do the internal rate of return, we will come up with a semi-annual It should be 0.075. There we are. We multiply that by two and we're back to this number here. All right. So that shows you the relationship between those two. All right. That is the basics of, of laying out the bonds we will have modules that go through this. There's going to be seven modules and we'll go through each one of these steps again. But that's the basics of laying out bond cash flows and also bond pricing and yield to maturity. We'll also talk about duration this week and that's what your homework will be. But duration is a measure of the uh, average time you get payments. So the duration for this bond would be something like 7.8 semi-annual periods or four, close to 3.8 um, years. And we'll talk about this on, the mod, on, on those modules. All right, they'll be up there soon. You have a homework. This uh, video with this lecture will be up there soon. And we will see you next week. Hey. Uh, the exam probably during this week, next week. Okay. I'll touch base with... Oh, hey, I'll touch base with you tomorrow, Enrique. Are you going to be around tomorrow? Okay. Yep. See ya. See ya.